it's like being dumped via a text message, you know, just that like real personal touch. Was that wishy washy Will or not too bad? Yeah, yeah, that, that was good. That's pretty That's good. good. He's okay, getting well, it. Uh, Will, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll create a word salad. Okay, well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the stream, an unscripted, unedited, free-flowing conversation featuring guests who reject the status quo with a bias for action in the world of water and beyond. My name is Tom Freyberg. I'm an environmental journalist and content creator specializing in water. And I'm Will Sarney, a water strategy consultant and investor doing my part to solve wicked water problems. And a big thanks to our sponsor, Athiona from Spain, as well as our impact partners for bringing the podcast to you today. And we are delighted to be joined by Brendan Tierney, who is the Managing Director and Global Head of Water at Raymond James. Brendan, good to see you. How are you? Good to be seen. Thanks for having me, Tom. Nice to see you, Will. Good to see you, always. Very good. So, um, Brendan, over the over the seasons, we're now in season five. We've we've sort of had our, our fair share of say investors um, and investment bankers on the stream. So we're sort of looking forward to hearing your your different perspectives. Um, we always like to, um, as you've heard, sort of hear about the origin story, sort of how you found that route to become the the global head of water for for Raymond James. So maybe you could give us sort of insight in into that that path, if if you will. Sure thing. I, you know, the funny thing is, you know, sometimes you you look for things and you find them. Uh, other times, things find you. And what what I'd say is, water found me. And I won't go back too far. Uh, but in 2000, I I did graduate from business school. I had my heart content on doing investment banking, uh, which I thought was a pretty neat, you know, position. Uh, to, to pursue, partly because I thought it was somewhat glamorous and somewhat exciting. And, you know, you've read about it in the Wall Street Journal, and there are certain things that just kind of tickled my fancy. And so I came out of, uh, you know, Cornell University in 2000 and pursued M&A on Wall Street. Did that for about eight years um, until I was shown the door from Citigroup uh, in an unceremonious fashion, lots of layoffs that year. And I was part of the problem. And so uh, ended up joining another investment bank um, called Janie Montgomery Scott. Jan Janie Montgomery Scott was hmm. headquartered in Philadelphia, which was where my wife was from. And so it was an easy decision for the Tierney household to seek greener pastures. Uh, had a great time there. Really learned from some of the best water practitioners out there. Uh, Deborah Coy, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Jim Lucas, Heike Dewar. Um, you name it. And so from there, we got pretty good uh, at consummating uh, M&A transactions. It was something that they hadn't focused on historically. They had been more focused on water utilities and doing more IPOs and secondary offerings. Um, and so that, that was great until, you know, truthfully, I felt as though we needed a more global platform. And so I, I did end up joining uh, another middle market investment bank called Raymond James in 2016 and have been there ever since. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't say, I, you know, we've lived happily ever after, but uh, it's close to it. I've got 11 or 12 individuals supporting the global water investment banking effort uh, here in Frankfurt and in London. Uh, we do focus on all things water, whether it's groundwater, potable water, wastewater, stormwater, or even leisure water, uh, which we call pool and spa water. And uh, we do that for products, technologies, and services. And so that's my that's my two-minute elevator speech there. How's that? Are we done? Yeah, we're done. Podcast we're done. is over. It, that's Friendly. a wrap? Stop, stop yeah, recording, it, guys. It's a wrap. Yeah, we're, we're finished. <laughs> yeah. I think it's interesting how you describe, well, firstly, Kind of having this um, this dream because you you thought the investment banking side was was glamorous, but obviously you mentioned there the the experience of of being shown the door at Citigroup, and I think um, it sounds awful, but I think everyone should go through a, a redundancy in some form because I I've been through one myself and it was the best thing to happen to me because I wouldn't probably wouldn't be doing the stream today, right? Well, had that not happened through a and that was as a result of an and A activity between two big. Um, event and media company so actually it was a spark and that needed to happen to sort of go on and, mm -hmm. and do Atlantia and everything else so um yeah would you would you sort of agree with that Brendan 
looking uh, well, back, it's probably painful at the time with City Group. But actually, you wouldn't be a wouldn't be a Roman James yeah. now, or even Water without that. Well, I've got a great. Well, it's a longer story for another time. But I received a phone call on vacation that I was being let go. So, if, nice. if you ever want to ruin a vacation, get a call that says you've been terminated. Maybe after a few drinks too. That that never helped. Hey, you know, it's it's like being dumped via a text message. You know, just that like real personal touch. You know, <laughs> you mean the sure not that, that when I got married. Not that not that that's happened to me, but I, I you know a friend. Um, you know, so is that the case I, of it's it's not it's not you it's me that text will yeah not pretty much I, yeah yeah it, it, almost quotable um, it, it, so it, you became a a water guy a water person um, it, and it was purely happenstance will it, it was really just it, landing in a situation where there were those who had really paved the the trail before me. It, so why why is it sticky? I mean, what what do you find interesting about the water sector that you know keeps you going uh, through the sort of ups and downs in the marketplace and and so on? You know, which we'll get into. But yeah, what's the what's the glue for you? That's a great question. That, I I think you know just reverting back to my prior comments around Wall Street and mm -hmm. you know what I describe as maybe being sexy and kind of a fun, exciting place to be as you get, as you get a little older and you start to realize that it's, it's not 100% about you and that there are children and a world and, and other things that go hand in hand with life after you're here. Um, I think that's what I started to realize I found in water um, was that it's a tremendously limited resource. Uh, as, as you've probably read numerous times, it's, it's tremendously wasted. Um, and it has a serious impact, not on only the environment, but on those in and around it. And so mm -hmm. in my deranged way, I, I found as though I was able to marry the, the sexiness of banking with kind of the, 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 the fun of trying to solve the world's problems. And so hopefully we're doing that. Hopefully we're helping people yeah. help themselves in the environment. Very cool. So talk a bit about then in terms of where where Raymond James is positioned. So you're investing into VCs and it's a, obviously you're not investing into individuals, entrepreneurs, companies, actually into other funds as part of your strategy, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think the best way to think about it is we are intermediaries uh, who serve as brokers for people looking to buy or sell companies. And so most of our work is focused on helping individual companies find a new home. And so we will market a business like Evoqua, like uh, Veolia's mobile water assets, uh, you name it, we'll help them find a new home. Uh, and we'll do that through an auction process. And in doing so, we're, we're often working closely with management and the owners uh, to really identify the core things that they would like to happen in a transaction. Because naturally, it's not always about money. Uh, it, it's also mm -hmm. about people uh, who, who help build the dream. And we've seen numerous examples of private company owners who have come to the end of their holding period, you know, whether it's succession issues, they don't have someone following mm -hmm. behind them and they just want what's best for their employees. And so that, that becomes a big part of it. Brendan, what are you seeing in the marketplace? You know, what, what's your take on what's going on right now uh in terms of you know privately held companies looking for an exit you know for a variety of reasons um in particular you know sort of over the past you know several years but maybe most recently in terms of you know how the uh sort of economic climates uh impacting the water sector and obviously other sectors also i think the MA market will in general is undergoing some serious duress, uh, large, largely due to you know, rising interest rates and, and limited availability of, of debt or leverage uh, to support such transactions. I think it's interesting to note that water is particularly resilient. Um, when I say resilient, resilient to a number of macroeconomic factors, just given, just given the fact that it's a scarce asset in that people cannot 
um, you know, overlook it. And so time, you know, you saw the Evoqua and Xylem transaction mm -hmm. right in the heat of, you know, kind of headwinds in the marketplace. You, you, you're seeing the Suez Veolia deal kind of wrap it up. Uh, you, you see the Danaher spinoff occur. You know, that's not unusual. We're seeing good assets, very good assets in the water space command very good premiums. Go ahead. No, no, you keep going. Yeah, and so I think from our perspective, if you have a strategic asset for which a company, an existing company, uh, would like to add to its core competencies or product adjacencies or geographic reach, they're going to overlook current economic factors. Mm -hmm. But if you have a business that is perhaps more focused on, you know, a private equity buyer, you you may be a little bit more challenged to get the outlier valuation outcome people have had. So it, it's, is it fair to say the inherent value of water is being manifested in terms of, you know, what's going on in the market right now that people realize that this is, you know, a tailwind, a trend that's not going away. It's, it's you know, it's something that absolutely drives economic development and business growth. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, you know, to your point, there's sustainability, there's, mm -hmm. there's you know, large consolidators, large global consolidators uh, looking for opportunities. It, it's really driving what you mentioned. I think it's really interesting and, and to come back to your point, Brendan, in terms of, you know, water being seen as an essential service and there's still, you know, in terms of the, the run up to 2030 and the SDGs, you know, the estimates are suggesting we have to quadruple our efforts in terms of giving people access to safe water and sanitation. But I, it's been a really interesting start to the year because on one side, you're seeing tens of thousands of, of job layoffs in tech, right, by some of the household name companies, right? And at the same time, we're seeing the, the record acquisitions happening in the water space. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the um, Xylem 7.5 billion acquisition of, uh, of Oakwood. So I think there's this like interesting sort of play going on, showing that actually that it's going to be a really interesting, perhaps unexpected year in water. So there's perhaps going to be more M&A activity taking place. We hope so. Um, you know, th there are a few key trends out there that hopefully will attract, you know, more talented and younger individuals, uh, particularly digitization. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think we all had a, a brief discussion on PFAS and stormwater, and we certainly think those are, you know, trends that will continue to develop as time goes on. But I, I, I'm somewhat cautiously optimistic, and, and usually I'm pessimistic. So this is a good sign, guys. <laughs> um, that, Hang out with us, Brendan. Really, I'll we'll, tell you. you know, we'll, we'll get you there. I'm feeling the love already. Um, you know, I, I'm cautiously optimistic <laughs> that digitization will provoke more interest, and in, and in so will sustainability. Yep. You know, when I was in college certainly was not thinking about saving the world as the kids are today. You see the bottles on their backpacks, you know, you see more uh, interest in, in marches and, and younger adults are, are far more proactive than I think I was back in my time. I think they're more intellectually challenged in terms of, or they want to be intellectually challenged uh, in terms of uh, technology and other things, how to make things more sustainable. Um, you know, given the aging workforce and utilities, you know, it just goes on. I, I think there are a lot of positive tailwinds kind of running into uh, the next five to 10 years. It, it, that, you know, there's the, the two dynamics that uh, you brought up, Tom, it's it's really interesting. So, you know, obviously the, the water sector, however you want to define it, both, you know, utilities, public sector and industry needs people, young professionals with digital skills. And, you know, the fact that suddenly there are, you know, a greater number of folks that are out looking, um, this might be the opportunity to make the water sector very appealing to them and, and bring them in, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and really accelerate transformation. Um, yeah, that's a, a two trends that are really, uh, you know, related and have a lot of positive potential. I was recently um, doing an interview with the CEO of a, a major European water utility. And um, I sometimes like to play the role of the devil's advocate, as you know well, Will. I said to said to the, the CEO, I said, so digitalization, 
it's a it's a buzzword right it's still and immediately and quite correctly he so he said absolutely not digital <laughs> is filtering through every single part of our business from the customer facing side through to accounting through to operations their digital twinning the entire network beyond the plan mm. and it was really clear that he had this vision of um of kind of even though the company has provided water for 130 years the the, the next 130 years is going to be completely different because of the impacts of climate change the workforce challenges you said brendan in terms of creating a digital first water company to attract new talent and mm -hmm. um it was really interesting to sort of see because often i think we we look at digital through these these pilots or these innovations or these tales of digital twins but actually from the top down having it in partnership with the, the business strategy of of the future of the utility was it, really interesting for me I, it, you know at the IWA, this is a bit of a plug, but the IWA uh, Digital Summit uh, late last year, you know, I, I would say the prevailing narrative was that um, it, it, it's not about digital technology, it's about transformation and strategy and, uh, you know, being digital and ensuring that it creates business value by aligning with value creation and strategy and so on. So I think we bumped into... Um, a bit of a milestone in that, yeah, there's a ton of digital tech out there, but the problem is not the tech, it's the people side mm -hmm. and the strategy side. And you you can't dabble in digital and expect suddenly you're going to be a, a digital utility or a digital, you know, industrial client, whatever it may be. Um, and I also think it's interesting that it's easy to say that the industrial side is further along on digital transformation than the utility sector, but I'm no longer convinced of that. I think they're sort of both trying to figure out, uh, you know, how to bring on digital technologies and, and create value. Uh, so it's, it's lumpy in both sectors. I, I think you need leaders, right? And in Europe, you had the AMP cycles, you know, that was kind of a, a mandatory um, kind of, not legislation, but ma mandatory call to the utilities to, to address the need for digitization. And then stateside, you, you end up getting some of the larger, you know, utility uh, municipalities, um, whether it's New York or, or Philadelphia or, or D.C. or Denver or, or Los Angeles. You know, they're the ones who are going to set the path for others mm -hmm. uh, naturally with 50, 60, 80, that whatever the, num the, the big number is. You know, you, you need the, 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 the giants to, to kind of step in and adopt it in order to make it acceptable. 100%. Yeah, de-risking it. Brendan, you mentioned yeah. uh, a word there in terms of trend, and that was PFAS. And obviously, that's something that everyone is talking about this year and um, from various conversations and advisory boards. This is the, the kind of the, the the hot issue, if you like. And I think there's, I'd like to, to hear from your point of view, how you see that playing out mid to long term in terms of potential M&A activity, perhaps unconventional collaborations. And I think there was a really good example of that with um, an article we wrote recently about this pilot. I think it was Denora partnered with Clarity on this mobile destruction technique. The pilot was sponsored by Xylem, but actually it was treating this landfill leachate as a, but actually creating that sort of tech stack and partnerships of different methods is going to be really interesting to see that play out driven by regulation that should have come in, you know, a long time ago. Yeah, it's it certainly is topical. Um, you know, we we are seeing it more and more and hearing it more and more. I was just out at the uh, American Water Summit uh, in Los Angeles last week. Um, one of the sponsors was a company called Aqua Agua. Uh, I may be pronouncing it wrong. That's how new the company is. <laughs> well, do you know how to pronounce it? Aquaga, I believe. And yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah, I, I, I know about the. Uh, marketing name but it's a wonderful concept <laughs> it doesn't roll off your tongue brendan come on <laughs> you know I'm, I'm challenged enough to speak uh well you know i, I don't need any uh well what we we'll do is we'll find out the correct pronunciation and we can dub it afterwards <laughs> yeah that's right we'll, we'll just have your mouth move and you know it'll be the founder's uh voice pronouncing it correctly um yeah i find them to be an interesting company out there because it's complete destruction yes. and you know they've they've done well in the market they've got a crowdfunding initiative and all that so 
Yeah, interesting space. It, it is, and you know, it, it's not enough these days to to just remove um, the issue, the PFAS from from the water source or the leachate. Mm -hmm. You know, people are becoming more demanding because you know the job isn't done after you remove it. You still have to to to, to dispose it, and so whether you're Evoqua, now Xylem, or Ecolab uh, through Kellen or Kellen Carbon or, or you know, Aqueous Vets, which uh, we just sold to a sustainability fund. Um, maybe that's a, a fun topic too. Hey, tell us more about that. Sure. So we, we were uh, mandated by a privately held company. Uh, the gentleman had worked for US Filter. Uh, mm -hmm. I think had a, a stint with Evoqua as well on the water treatment side. He had identified this, this emerging issue uh, of PFAS on the West Coast throughout California and the progressive regulatory bodies that were limiting the amount of content, um, the MCLs in, in water and went out and created a, a better mousetrap for the removal of PFAS. Um, Rob Cry is his name. Um, he grew it so quickly uh, in the course of five years that the business really almost outgrew him, truthfully. And, hmm. you know, it got to the point where he needed a, a partner to, to see it to its next, you know, successful stage of life. And so we were working with him closely to find a partner in, you know, sustainability funds, ESG funds, which uh, have grown immeasurably over the last five years and expected to, to continue to grow. Uh, quite a bit. Um, we're very interested, and he we were able to partner with Bain Capital mm. uh, out of Boston, who had done a, a tremendous amount of white paper work on the space, uh, and have worked very closely with them over the last twelve to eighteen months to to create the right infrastructure uh, within the mm. business to to become a national platform uh, and help save lives and 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 really treat water that hadn't been treated. Interesting. I definitely agree with you about, you know, the rise of, you know, ESG, uh, you know, as a major driver of sustainability funds and, and so on. Uh, you know, one thing we're seeing is that startups and early growth stage companies are now building that ESG value creation into their, their strategy and their value proposition. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And it, it's, it's really uh, adding a lot of value. Will, Will, do you do you think they get value back? In other words, it's it's one thing to say you're you're doing good and you're tracking your metrics. And do you feel as though investors give them a premium relative to those who don't? Yeah, I, I I'd say I, I I believe it depends. So, if a company can deliver quantifiable ESG performance to a multinational, then that's a pretty important part of their value proposition. And I would say, depending on the fund, they would value that piece, not because of that little piece, it's because of the opportunity to scale with customers that need that desperately right now. Because, you know, I, it, conversations I have is that, you know, multinationals are spending money on ESG reporting and, you know, water stewardship initiatives, but don't have the information to actually quantify the return on that investment. So if a technology company can fit in that space where they can say, I can quantify the value from that dollar invested in a watershed, then that's attractive to the company, the multinational, and in turn to an investor that's looking at the space and saying, okay, you know, you, 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 you're, you're delivering something to uh, an industry sector that values that. And did that answer your question, Brendan, in terms of- it, Yeah, you were extremely wishy-washy. I appreciate that. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a consultant. Um, I mean, you know, you, you get what you say. Um, no, honestly, I think, Brent, I think you wait, well. wait, Brendan. I'm great in a deposition, by the way. <laughs> I will ask the. I will answer the question they should have asked me, as opposed to the one they actually did. <laughs> well said. Well said. <laughs>
Very good. So um, uh, Tom is ready to dump me now, by the way. I, I think I'm never, getting a text message. Never. Get, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not you. It's me, Will. OK, yeah. we're, we're done. Um, OK, so just to sort of um, comment on we've we've all talked about it, but to sort of get some flesh out the commentary on that. Um, Brendan, you mentioned the the, the juggernaut merger between uh, Xylem and Avoqua that came out only a few weeks ago. To many, it came as a bit of a surprise. I mean, it's um, two of the, the biggest US water technology companies joining forces. Um, certainly a record at 7.5 billion. So it'd be interesting to sort of get your your views on on that and, and sort of how you think that may impact innovation when you've got that sort of scale together as well. It's a great question. I, I think the, the fantastic uh, perspective on behalf of Xylem is that they know the asset extremely well. Uh, the marketplace would tell you that they have been off and on for the last nine, nine or 10 years uh, mm -hmm. since Siemens carved out the, the, the business to AEA. Um, mm -hmm. And naturally, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's not much of a market secret, but when AEA took the company public, uh, Xylem was in advanced discussions with them as well. And so they've been tracking this thing for some time. Uh, I think they've always been interested by the capabilities on the wastewater side, particularly on the industrial side, as, as Ron Keating and team has really done a nice job over the last four or five years in developing uh, a, a more pronounced industrial platform relative to the municipal side. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Xylem was also very interested in, you know, things like PFAS. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, Evoqua has a strong presence in that. Things like coal ash pond remediation, you know, the treatment of of uh, CCR uh, down at the electrical utilities. Um, and so there were a lot of different emerging technologies that some might say Evoqua was well advanced uh, that Xylem would like to, to be a part of. They also had a nice digital platform um, that they leveraged their 2000 or so sales representatives, which mm -hmm. they believe they can begin to cross sell on the water side. And so there, there's a lot of opportunities, not just on the technology side, but on the service side. And, you know, I, I think, you know, we just got off a board call a little while ago and the, the question was, what is the optimal amount of recurring revenue streams for a company to have in the water space? And after we said 100%, you know, we, we, we kind of came to a more <laughs> reasonable conclusion that, you know, 35 to 50% would be uh, an ideal amount of uh, exposure, just given the predictability um, that, that recurring revenues bring. And I think that's why Xylem really liked the platform. Did I answer your question? Did I you did. On? Yeah, you did. Yeah. yeah um, you, you sounded like me for a moment. I, I think it's, you know, rubbing off. Um, the talking circles. <laughs> no, no, you just dodged it. That's yeah. no, it was fine. <laughs> All right. We still have these on the book. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's um, an interesting marriage, right? Where you mentioned you've got the utility offering combining with the industrial offering, the kind of the product and solution offering merging with a service offering. And I think. I've been writing about from the spin out of ITT and Xylem back in the day to sort of that digital acquisition spree of buying sensors through to mm -hmm. um, Pure and then Vicente to sort of carve out that digital um, market, if you like, from Xylem's point of view. But I think the for any of, especially on this scale, the integration is going to be absolutely fundamental to sort of, if you think you've got two juggernauts of acquired units and companies coming together. So it'll be interesting to see how that how that plays out. But I think as to agree with you, I think there's going to be a really strong value proposition in, in markets like water quality, where PFAS is becoming an increasing concern as well. So um how about that? Was that was that wishy washy will or not too bad? Yeah, yeah, that, that was good. That's pretty good. He's okay. getting it. Uh Will, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll create a word salad and just, you know, confuse everyone. Um, yeah, it's it's really going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, you know, there's always the 
perfect fit when you you look at it in terms of capabilities and you know revenue and and so on uh and then you know merging the cultures obviously is is going to be a big part of uh you know the the effort that goes into it uh, yeah it, it's going to be a really interesting year in terms of you know the carve out of Danaher and Suez Veolia you know and and now the the Xylem acquisition of Evoqua uh, and you layer in what's going on in the startup world and, and see who is in a position to take advantage of you know some of the really interesting you know digital technologies which we touched on very briefly mm -hmm. uh out there yeah one, well one, one thing you brought up which i find kind of interesting is you know the fact that while while the transaction in and of itself is interesting there is a ripple effect that occurs beyond it um and and part of that would be there's going to be a significant amount of talented professionals that may not you know may, may no longer have a home or you know there may be orphaned assets um, yes you know which, which is always you know opportunistic for for consolidators in the space and so we we've seen a number of suez professionals find new homes obviously you know that's part of the that's baked into the the merger right you know mm -hmm. the the synergies that are 140 million with Evoquin Xylem, you know, there are going to be talented people out there who are going to join some, some newer companies and really hopefully revitalize uh, some of the startups and, and other opportunities. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. You know, it's, it's more than what meets the eye in terms of, you know, the carve out, the acquisitions, you know, the, the mergers, it is the fallout from that, that, will really change the rest of the marketplace and you know to your point there's going to be a lot of talent out there looking for a home either with startups you know early growth stage companies and and you know Tommy brought this up in terms of you know what the tech sector is you know experiencing right now those people looking for a home with talent that I, I think the industrial and the utility sectors you know need desperately right now in order to really be a more sustainable, resilient, you know, business, whether you're a utility or, you know, making beer, whatever it may be. So it'll be interesting to really track this and, and see where the opportunities lie. I love the orphaned assets. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what the throwaways look like, right? <laughs> well, it, it's inter it's interesting, though, because we, we just sold a business uh, called UGSI, uh, which was which was led by Andy Seidel. Uh, one of the, oh, the yeah. chief architects of um, oh God, I can't remember U.S. Filter. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very successful in identifying these orphans out of the very platform that he helped build. He revitalized a number of these assets. Um, most of them focused on water quality and water treatment. Packaged them very neatly into uh, this business called UGSI and. Just had a nice outcome uh, with a new partner in Beard Capital who's excited about, you know, getting bigger and stronger within kind of the water treatment side of the equation. And so a nice success story there. Very good. Yeah. Brendan, um, we've just just looked just looked at the uh, the timer. We're sort of just over that that magic <laughs> 30 minutes. So um yeah, really generally interesting to sort of hear your views on um I think it's a, a different side to the investment we, we've heard from before as well. So it's and quite timely given the recent um, merger that we've just spoken about. So um, yeah, good luck with the the sort of the rest of the the team at Raymond James. And I think um, as we've all said, twenty twenty three is going to be a really interesting year to see the fallout and potentially you know uh, talent placement and and maybe the formation of new companies and innovations in the space as well. So yeah, appreciate the time. Thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. And uh, Tom will until next time. Sounds good. Um, and Brendan, are you going to WaterTech in London or where are you headed next? I will be in Berlin uh, for the oh, Global okay. Water Summit. Uh, but my my colleague in Frankfurt, I believe, is going uh, to London for that conference. OK, Florian. great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I met him in New Orleans. Um, Sober? I, I, me or him? <laughs> we, uh, we we should definitely save this for the opening of the podcast. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I was going to say that's yeah. episode two, right? Um, <laughs> there we go. Brendan, right. thanks so much for your support and, and being on the call. Really value your 
your point of view in terms of what's going on and where things might go in the, in the coming year. So big thanks. Awesome. Thank you guys. Right, so thanks for doing speech soon. Take care. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you.